Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. Whether you're a high-end athlete or a weekend warrior, the reality is that sports and other physical activities sometimes result in injury. Among the most common orthopedic injuries are injuries to our knees. Our guest today is conducting a research study at UVM that is looking at certain knee injuries for which the patient had has had surgery. Nick Fiorentino is a biomechanist in UVM's Department of Mechanical Engineering, where he leads the Musculoskeletal Imaging and Orthopedic Biomechanics Research Lab. His research goals are to improve the overall health and well-being of those who have suffered an orthopedic injury. Nick, good after in, afternoon and, and thank you for being with us. Yeah, uh, no problem. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for hosting me. So what kind of knee injuries are you looking at in this study? Yeah, this study is focusing on people who have had an ACL injury, an anterior cruciate ligament injury in their knee, as well as an injury to their meniscus, um, which is another structure inside the knee. Right, and, and so we're on the same page. You brought along a, some images of, of a knee. Um, so as we take a look, why don't you give us a brief description of the areas that your research is focusing on? Yeah, great. This is a view of the front of the knee. So if you're looking at um, someone's knee from in front of them, um, there's a kneecap on front of the knee. And underneath that, there are a few ligaments that help support the stability of the knee and make sure um, that it stays in place. And there's the anterior cruciate ligament, which has a red box around it, which stops the knee from moving forward and back too much. Um, and then there's the meniscus, which is in blue, which is a circular shaped structure that absorbs some of the load as we're moving. Um, and as we're doing different activities, especially sporting activities, those structures uh, can tear. So what are you hoping to learn from this research study uh, about this, about surgery and then what happens later? Yeah, so ultimately people end up getting osteoarthritis uh, more quickly than the average population. And we're not really sure why. Um, so we're trying to figure out what happens to the knee joint shortly after surgery. Is it something about the way that people move? Um, is it something about the cartilage that is injured initially? And is there an interplay between those two? It's a structure function relationship in the knee shortly after surgery. So is, is the whole developing arthritis a, a real concern? Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it puts people at about a five times greater risk of developing osteoarthritis by middle age. Um, and given that about 200,000 people tear their ACL every year in the United States, um, that's a big portion of our population that could be at risk for developing arthritis. Um, so it's something that the government is interested in helping us figure out um, before people who are playing sports now get to middle age um, and might suffer from osteoarthritis earlier than they would um, just from age-related effects. Right, and maybe you can prevent it. So for your research study, what, what kind of volunteers are you looking for? So we're looking for people who are younger than that middle age group, so people who are 18 to 39. Um, and they've had their first ACL injury as well as their first injury to the meniscus. Um, and they've had those surgically repaired. Um, there are a few other criteria about um, not having any back pain, um, which could influence our measurements, as well as being um, less than 250 pounds for people um, who are physically active. So if somebody's potentially interested, what's the time commitment and, and what do they need to do? Yeah, that's a great question. So people who would, they would need to come in between one years and two years after surgery. Um, and there are four study visits and the total time um, is about six hours um, for which people are compensated um, $550. Uh, and then each one of the visits there is flexible scheduling. So we can work with people on their schedules to come in um, when it's convenient. So, you know, Nick, people might not expect that knee research is being conducted by a biomechanist, <laughs> um, you know, basically an engineer from the College of Engineering and Mathematical Sciences. Um, it might be something that we would expect from the College of Medicine or, or, or a doctor. So how does your engineering expertise um, really, what, what does that bring to the table? Yeah, so it brings some more kind of novel measurements about the knee joint function 
Um, so I have an imaging system that's able to image people's bones as they move um, in what's called a gait laboratory. Um, then we also are able to measure more fine details about their cartilage. So we bring some kind of novel experimental techniques that you might not see in more of a traditional clinical setting. Um, however, you know, my laboratory is housed over in the College of Medicine okay. and I have collaborators um, in orthopedics as well as physical therapy and athletic training. Um, so I wouldn't say that we're necessarily distinct um, from the College of Medicine. There's definitely overlap, but we bring some more advanced uh, techniques um, that we're able to use to kind of get at some of these research questions about what changes early on. Right, and, and what you might be able to do about it, I would. I yeah, would and in the long run, this is feeding into more kind of advanced novel therapeutics where then if we can identify what changes when, because um, sometimes there's a chicken and the egg question of is it the function that changes because of the surgery or is it something about the knee joint structure itself? You know, we can do these imaging techniques to better tease that out and then develop new techniques that can then kind of target those problems. Um, and uh, again, uh, where where do people um, go? Just just your number, and if if they've had an injury um, and and a, a surgery on their mm -hmm. knee within the last eighteen months, where do, where do they call? Yeah, so they can call call me at, at UVM. There's my number um, on the screen: eight zero two six five six eight zero eight two, or send me an email. It's my full name: nicolo at uvm edu. And we can have a conversation about it. And then I also have a study resource coordinator who can reach out to them. We can get more details about their surgery and ensure that they are qualified for the study um, before they come in. And, and tell us just a little bit more about um, quickly about the work that uh, other work you might be doing in the lab. Yeah, so we have other studies where we're generally interested in, you know, the joint function and relating that to long term disease, you know, with this idea, like you said, that we want to kind of figure out what's happening after surgery to help develop techniques to kind of stop this process of people getting arthritis too quickly. Um, so overall, we use MRI to look at high detailed structural measurements in the knee as well as functional measurements um in the gate lab so we're really excited about that and kind of branching out and looking at different joints um, as well as different patient populations okay well nick thank you so much i think we all are hoping that our knees will last a long time and you're there to help us um, yeah. and so best of luck to your research we hope that some people um, get back to you and, and contact you um, and help you with your research uh, you'll have to get back with us and let us know what you've learned I will, definitely. Thank you very much. To close out today's program, we're going to get an interesting science lesson from the Lake Champlain Sea Grant Institute. We don't think much about it, but the lake, like our landscape, experiences different seasons. So here's a look at what happens to the lake season to season. Lakes are dynamic systems. Throughout the year, Lake Champlain experiences thermal stratification and lake turnover. What happens is occurring below the surface of the water in Lake Champlain from season to season. First, what is lake turnover and thermal stratification? Second, what impact do these events have on aquatic life? In the same way we visualize shifts in the landscape, the same things are happening at the depths of Lake Champlain throughout the course of the year with the changing of the seasons. Lake turnover is exactly what it sounds like. Water moves from the top of the water column to the bottom in a mixing event. What is happening in the lead up to these mixing events? Thermal stratification is the process in which the lake becomes divided into layers based on water temperature and density. As the summer progresses, stratification becomes stronger and will create niche segments throughout the water column. When the lake is stratified, there is going to be warmer water at the surface and colder water at the bottom of the lake. What you are seeing right now is a visualization of how the lake temperature shifts throughout the year based on physical effects in the atmosphere above, like temperature changes and winds. Lake Champlain turns over twice a year, once in the spring and once in the fall. The lake begins to cool in the early fall, taking cues from decreasing air temperatures. This cooling process shifts the density of the water and denser water is heavier, sinking to the bottom of the water column. When it does this, it actually forces the warmer water to the surface. 
This cooling process sparks one of the annual lake turnover events in Lake Champlain. What impact does this have on the aquatic organisms that live in Lake Champlain? Lake turnover is an important phenomenon because it allows for the redistribution of oxygen and nutrient-rich surface waters to the deeper waters of the lake. In the fall, wind moves highly oxygenated surface water to the bottom of the water column. This is incredibly important because once the lake freezes over, it eliminates the opportunity for atmospheric oxygen to be mixed into the water column. Why doesn't the lake continue to turn over throughout the winter as the temperatures decrease further? In the winter, ice forms when the lake's surface temperature reaches 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Ice, as we know from ice floating in a glass of water, is lighter and less dense than the water itself. The ice acts as a barrier, preventing the lake from mixing. In addition, it also limits the lake's ability to exchange atmospheric oxygen. As air temperatures rise in the spring and the ice thaws, the surface of the lake warms, pushing down the colder water, which is denser. This is the second mixing event. Lake Champlain is a natural treasure. We all have a part to play in protecting it and the waters that drain to it, now and into the future. This video was produced by Lake Champlain Sea Grant, a partnership among the University of Vermont, SUNY Plattsburgh, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. To learn more about Lake Champlain Sea Grant, and to see other videos in this series, please visit our website. Fascinating. I love what scientists do for all of us. And that's our program for today. Once again, thank you for joining us across the fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. Stay well.